Wednesday, February 15th, 1995, and we're talking with Charles Wyckoff about his work with Harold Edgerton. Um, by way of introduction, could you tell us about how you came to MIT and got into Doc's lab and, and tell us your story from the beginning? Okay. There is a beginning. <laughs> the, uh, I, uh, I, I went to Dartmouth College, and I figured that I need a, needed a little more technical experience, so I came down to MIT. And uh, a friend of mine had already preceded me, and he knew of Doc, and he came around to me one day, and he said, uh, he knew that I was interested in color photography. I'd, I already had a patent pending on that. And so he said, I think Doc would be interested in having you part of the scene. So he introduced me to Doc, and uh, it looked very interesting. So in 1939, in conjunction with my studies here, I started to piddle around with Doc in the lab and helped him out here and there. And that's how I. I finally got hooked on Doc because, as everybody knows, he's kind of a magic character. He's got a he's got a very inviting personality <clears throat> that makes you want to work with him. Uh, the first thing he did was to uh, show me some of the experiments he was working on, and they were exactly what I had in mind. So from that day on, I was hooked. That was the first big project that you worked on, the nighttime aerial reconnaissance photography no. development? <clears throat> no, uh, that didn't come until later. Uh, the, the first big project uh, really was connected with the Navy. We, uh, uh, Doc and I, would go down to, to uh, the Dahlgren Proving Ground, the Navy Proving Ground, and then we'd alternate and go <coughs> to the Army Proving Ground at Aberdeen. And uh, we would take the micro flash along and a couple of cameras and photograph bullets going through the air just before they impacted a, uh, a steel target. And uh, this was, of course, before the, before the war. Now, an interesting episode there, by the way, uh, occurred at Aberdeen. We had a, uh, uh, a big bomb up on a pole. I've forgotten what it was, maybe 10,000 pounds or something like that. The biggest one that uh, they had exploded so far. Well, they hadn't exploded it yet. They were getting ready to. And it was full of instruments. And uh, Doc and I had a camera called the Jenkins camera. It was one that he got from the widow of C. Francis Jenkins. And he dug it out of the museum. Not this museum, because this museum hadn't started yet. And we uh, conditioned that camera so that we could take pictures. And it was, uh, we used a, a bent piece of metal from the USS Kearsarge hull as our, as our shelter. So the camera would be inside this shelter. By means of a mirror, it would look at the bomb over here. And uh, <coughs> we had selected the, we didn't select the site, but somebody at Aberdeen had selected this site as being a perfect site because it was in the middle of an artillery range and nobody would come around and, and you know, be too near the bomb when it went off. So we were just about finished with our preparation, just about ready to start the test, and we were going to leave when all of a sudden we heard bullets coming over. <laughs> Boom, and they landed fairly close to us. So everybody scrambled to get out of there. And Doc was out taking pictures at the time, so he calmly folded up his camera. And I stayed behind in here, and he, Doc was out in the front. I said, what are you doing out there? And he said, well, the bullets are coming from here, Charlie. You're going to get hit. And I said, the bomb is over there, Doc. <laughs> if it goes off, you're going to get hit. So <laughs> we argued back and forth. We finally settled the thing and went into, went into safety immediately. <laughs> so, so that was my, interesting to, or my, my introduction to kind of uh, harebrained things that happened to us from then on. And the adapted Jenkins camera was a motion picture? That was a motion picture camera, 35 millimeter. It used nitrate film, because that's all there was in those early days. And of course, that's a, an explosive hazard in itself. Uh, the, the camera would operate. It was built in 1916, by the way. And this camera would operate at 3,000 pictures per second. And uh, about every third or fourth time you operated it, it would jam and burst into flames. <laughs> So <laughs> that meant that we had to take, it had 48 lenses in it. That meant that uh, I had to take it all apart, clean each lens out, and put it back together again. That's, 
have to talk more about that another time. <laughs> um, okay, so how did how did that work um, of blowing things up and photographing it <laughs> <laughs> translate through your career? Because I know this is a common theme <laughs> going here. Well, it is e ending up with ABOBs. That right. was the biggest. <laughs> uh, Tell us about the path from, uh, well, from Dahlgren to ABOBs. All right, let's get down to Dahlgren for a moment <clears throat> because this is almost an introduction now to uh, ABOBs. Uh, there were two officers down there, two naval officers, uh, in, in connection with this testing we were doing on bullets. Uh, one of them was a man by the name of Norris Bradbury, who ultimately went out to Los Alamos in the Manhattan Project, and he became the director of the Los Alamos lab. We met him down there. Another one was Admiral Parsons. He was a commander at that time. And he became the chief weaponeer for the Japanese bombs. So. We didn't know that that's what was going to happen, but uh, that's uh, some of our experience at, at uh, Dahlgren, the Navy Proving Ground. And uh, then the war was beginning to show up. Uh, we still weren't in the war, but uh, Colonel Goddard got a hold of Doc and wanted something to replace flash bombs. And so Doc started working on the, the uh, electronic flash for airplane use. And uh, we were all uh, all involved in that project for a while. This, the war still hadn't started. And uh, as I was explaining to you earlier, one of the ways we would test this thing would be to have airplanes fly out of Logan at different altitudes, and then we'd photograph these planes so that we would know how far away we could photograph. In other words, what altitude we had to fly in order to get a good picture on the ground. And we were able to do this with, uh, uh, I hate to say it, but Doc's brashness uh, in, <laughs> in uh, calling up a pilot and say, would you fly over MIT for us at a certain altitude? And that's how we did it. Then later on, uh, the, the Navy, now we got into the war, and the Navy was calling. And Doc said, Charlie, you, you take the Navy stuff. And I'm going to work on this stuff for the uh, Army Air Corps. And uh, so we kind of split at that time. I handled all the Navy stuff, and Doc handled the Air Force stuff, along what, with Fred Barstow. What was Barstow. the difference? What's that? What was the difference? Was it the same equipment, just the two forces? Or were, was there a difference between oh, the, no, what the Navy used and what the Army Air well, Corps Well, there was used? quite a bit of difference, because the Army was interested in this. The Army Air Corps was interested in the, in the uh, electronic flash from the air. Mm -hmm. And that was a different thing altogether. Uh, the the, dura the flash duration didn't have to be as short as it did for taking pictures of, uh, of bullets or shock waves. So uh, this was just a matter of Doc putting together all kinds of capacitance to, to really pump a lot of uh, electronics into the flash tube. And so that kept him busy just working on that, whereas my stuff with the Navy was just the standard microflash and things like that. So your work's continued out of what you were doing at Dahlgren. That's right. And it was yeah. a continuation of bullet and artillery yeah. tests. And then we went uh, <coughs> in Washington. There was a place called the, the Model Basin, which is, again, run by the Navy. And they had a water tank. And uh, they would explode uh, little charges underwater. And uh, I would take high-speed motion pictures of it. Now, this was simulating what a mine or a torpedo would do underwater. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, Doc would come down and see what was happening, and he'd offer his advice. And this is the way we got going. Who else worked with you on this from from Doc's immediate circle? I know Fred Barstow was Fred, involved, well, but was he with the electronic no, flash, or was he? he with no. You? Well, yes, uh, it's electronic flash in each case. Right. Uh, sorry, I meant. But the, he he the concentrated air, with one. with Doc on the aerial stuff. Right. Whereas I yes. Now, swig of water. I think I will because I'm getting a little. Exactly. So take your time and you can do that whenever you like. Now, Fred started out, by the way, uh, doing a thesis under Doc. And this was an interesting story. Uh, he was studying shockwave propagation in glass and crystalline things. And uh, he had a lab up on uh, the second floor, Building 10. And uh, not a lab, he had an office there. And 
he had shattered glass all over the floor. The <laughs> custodians were afraid to go in there, <laughs> so he had to do his own cleaning. Now, the interesting part of that story is not the glass on the floor, but he decided that he was going to study uh, this same phenomenon uh, with, with sugar, with, with crystals of sugar. So he got a hold of some candy, candy manufacturer who gave him all sorts of samples of sugar in plate form. And whenever I'd come in to visit him, we'd start eating up his samples. <laughs> 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 so when it got down to the time he really wanted them, he didn't have any samples left, he had to send for some more. But uh, so that's how Fred got started with, with Doc. <clears throat> and he was more interested in the electronics. And uh, so he helped Doc and Ken Germershausen put the electronics together for the aerial photography group. And so during the war, Although Doc went abroad and Fred stayed in the lab here at MIT, he was, he was part of Doc's team on that, mm -hmm. whereas I, I was strictly Navy. Now, you said that you originally came to MIT because of your interest in color photography. No, no, because I realized I needed some technical education, which I only got a moderate amount of at, at Dartmouth. I happened to be interested in, <coughs> in color photography. and. Uh, that's, uh, that's really how I got associated with Doc, because this friend of mine, uh, Evan Pancake, thought that uh, I might be able to add something to Doc. In other words, Doc was interested in color at that time, so perhaps my background might have been a little more suitable than most people. And especially since I was interested in photography, new darkroom technology and all this, it mm -hmm. looked like a good, good partnership, which it turned out to be. So does that mean that when Doc started developing uh, the Codatron for studio work and he used that for some early color photography right. in the studio, you were part of that yes, as well? Yes, that's right. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Uh, uh, in the early days, uh, we did all the glass blowing right in the lab at MIT. So all the tubes were made right there. and. Uh, the gas filling these tubes in the early days, in the very early days, was strictly hydrogen and then mercury. And of course, these were not very good as light emitters. And then uh, along came krypton, and that was much better. And so the, the studio units started out with krypton, but they were deficient in certain colors, so that it was very difficult to get a good color picture using a krypton tube. And I don't know what Doc did, but he got a hold of somebody at the General Electric plant in Cleveland, Neela Park, who was interested in, in the exotic gases, the rare gases. And so this fellow showed up one day in, the, in our office at MIT with a flask. And he said, here is the world's largest supply of xenon gas, right here. <laughs> and so we started filling the tubes with that. And uh, I made some spectrograms showing what the light output of that was contrasted with krypton. And it looked perfect. It looked just like sunlight. So we started using that in our, in our so-called studio units, the Codatron units. And that made color photography with electronic flash much more practical than it had been, although color pictures were made before that. Why was xenon so hard to come by? Uh, it didn't have any, any use. And here it is floating around in the atmosphere. But so there was it, no it, demand. There was no demand so for there it. There was no yeah. supply. I see. Whereas argon, I, I forgot to mention argon. Argon came along before krypton. And argon, of course, was in use long before krypton was, and it's used for the welding industry. So there was an abundant supply of, of argon, and then krypton began to be used for the same thing. So there was a more abundant supply of that. But nobody, nobody wanted xenon. They didn't even know about it. So this fellow from GE managed to somehow or another find out how to <laughs> collect it and make it, and uh, that's how we got started. We didn't want to. We didn't want to tell him right away. That's what we're going to use because we didn't have any to test out right. in order to make a spectrogram to see what it would be like. But it was a, it was a perfect simulation of sunlight. Okay. So the the war. You've gone through the war. You've photographed all these bullets, you're getting into... Well, we haven't really gone through the war yet. Okay. Some of these things <laughs> happened during that time. 
and some of them occurred before that time and some of them occurred after that time. But now let's, uh, let's get after the war. Okay. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> since the war was really over uh, and the A-bombs had already, three of them had already been exploded, one of them in Alamogordo, New Mexico, two of them over Japan, and the fourth one was going to be a Navy test out of Bikini. And uh, so since I had established myself with a Navy connection, uh, it was obvious that these Navy people wanted me to be involved in that. So I got involved from the standpoint of Edgerton, Germazowden, and Greer. That's what the partnership was called at that time. I was, I was the Navy representative from, e from Edgerton, Germazowden, and Greer on that test. And that was probably the world's largest fiasco. I don't think there'll ever be another one as big as that. Why? What, what, what well, went wrong? Everything went wrong. Everything you can think of. Uh, this was a big show. The Navy said, there's no, there's no bomb that's going to sink our ships. You know, so we'll get them out in force and we'll test them and we'll find out. And the, uh, the Air Force, of course, hadn't been, the Air Force hadn't come into being as an Air Force. It was still the U.S. Army Air Corps. And they were the ones that were going to drop the bomb on the target ship. The target ship in that case was the Nevada, which was a victim at Pearl Harbor, but they salvaged it and reconditioned it, and it, it served its, uh, its, its duty during World War II. And then afterwards, they said, let's use that ship as our target ship. So they painted it a bright orange color because that's supposed to signify danger. They knew that uh, red would be darker, so they picked orange, but it turned out that orange was a bad color too because from 20 or 30 miles it blended into the ocean. You couldn't see it. So the, uh, the bombing people uh, just couldn't see it. So they had 36 inch arc searchlights aimed right down the bombing alley. And uh, the bombardier still couldn't see it until they got within about 15 miles. And that's too close. They couldn't alter their course. And so I heard about this, and I just had one of the pieces of equipment that I had with me. You know, when I went out on this thing, I didn't know what I was going to be faced with, so I took all the equipment I could think of that we might use. One of them was a unit that we called a sea search unit. This was something that, was, that we developed during the war to fly at fairly low altitudes looking for submarines. And when we'd see something, then we'd flash and we'd get a picture of it. And that looked like uh, a unit that I might use somewhere on this test, so I brought it along. We'll have a slight break here. <coughs> and uh, incidentally, during all this uh, decision making that the, uh, with the carbon arc searchlight, they said this is the wrong color of the ship, so let's paint it white. So all the superstructure was painted white. And the white paint didn't dry right away, so we were all walking around in white paint. <laughs> that made a mess. And uh, I had lunch with the skipper of the ship one day, and of course I dragged my white painted <laughs> shoes <laughs> onto his nice carpet. And he had a piano in his office. I said, what's the piano for? He said, well, you know, I, I like to play the piano, so I brought it along. So well, you're going to lose it. He said, nah, I'm going to sail this ship back to Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so. <laughs> He said, I'll, I'll tell you something right now. <clears throat> this ship was not seaworthy. I had all the pumps going full blast in order to keep it afloat to get out here. He said, but I'm going to sail it back to Pearl Harbor after the test. Well, he was right. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the, uh, I tried this sea search unit out. I mounted the thing up on the mast right beside the 36-inch carbon searchlights. And it was radio controlled so that the, the bombardier could flash it any time he wanted. Mm -hmm. So when he got to a position where he said, let me see if I can see it, <coughs> he would flash it. And he found that he could f see this thing from 40 miles out wow. as opposed to 15. Right. So that was a very useful thing. So you might say that uh, this should have made everything perfect. Well, it helped, but not quite enough. The, uh, this was the very first large-scale test where telemetry was, was being used for the first time. Now, telemetry is, means really that you're, you're going to uh, radio out your signals 
to a remote spot so they don't get damaged. And since this was a Navy show, the Navy selected their smartest statisticians and decided where the antenna should be to, you know, to, to transmit the data. And uh, where do you think zero point actually turned out to be? On the antenna. Over the antenna. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one thing that was bad. Uh, another thing that was bad was that the, uh, the Army Air Corps fellows said that we can hit a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet, so we'll have no trouble dropping the bomb right on the Nevada. Well, the trouble is there was no pickle barrel. <laughs> the, uh, the bombardier was, was not given access to this bomb until the last minute, and the casing was not what he was told it was. And it turned out that the casing was not airworthy. So as the bomb was released, the tail bent. It didn't pull off, but it bent, and so it didn't go down the way it was supposed to go down. So it landed a half mile off target. And that's why it landed on the, on the antennas. So the Nevada was saved. And uh, now another thing that happened, uh, the Manhattan district had been disbanded. There wasn't any more. And so Los Alamos was kind of on their own. There was no Atomic Energy Commission yet. And they were the ones that supplied the timing signals out to each person who was doing an experiment. And I had some, I had some high speed motion picture cameras out there and the total recording time, the total time on and off before we ran out of film was two seconds. Well, the, the zero time didn't come along until 17 seconds after the explosion. So obviously I didn't get any records. It was all, all wiped out right there. But I did have some other instruments that were self-supporting. They were operating by a photocell, so I did get those records. So here we were, the, the zero, the, the nobody that really needed uh, precise timing got any data hmm. because the timing signals didn't go off. Right. And all the reporters, the news photographers, the uh, or newspapers, the magazine reporters, radio, they, uh, any we talk, I mean, Bikini was such a nice place that they, you know, they liked it on the beach and they wrote all their stories the day beforehand. And they said, well, all we have to do is ship them out now, and that's it, we'll watch the thing. Well, of course, it didn't work the way their stories said, so there was a mad scrabble to try to get the stories back <laughs> and then write it the way it should have been. Now you can see why I said it's the world's largest fiasco. Mm, it really like was. It. <laughs> we, had, we had Russian visitors out there, and we had everybody. It was open to the public almost. So from then on, the security was a lot more tight, and <laughs> we were able to do things then. So tell us about the development of the, the Rapidronic and, and, and some more successful tests. Oh, all right. Tests. <coughs> um, the very first official job that, uh, incidentally, uh, EG&G &G was still Edgerton, Germersout, and Greer, and we had our offices right here at MIT. And uh, we had to have our own guards, you know, for security. And the very first test that, uh, that we went on officially, not, not the bikini test, uh, officially from Edgerton, Germersout, and Greer was in 1947 or 48 called Sandstone. And we were not doing photography on that test. We were doing photocell work with uh, oscillos oscilloscopes and things like that. And uh, it was strictly a shipboard operation. We weren't in the we weren't in the, uh, on land. And uh, so during the, during the, the time, no, I, we, we, I beg your pardon, we did have some stations on land. We had some big reflectors with photocells in them and they were telemetered out to our ship. Anyhow, during the waiting period, we got to talking with some of the guests out there and it turned out these guests that we were talking with were what you might call embryo Atomic Energy Commissioners. They were about to form, but they hadn't formed yet. And the uh, Wright Patterson was doing the high-speed photography, and we told them we thought that was the wrong approach, even though that's basically what we did, high-speed motion pictures. We said that's the wrong approach. And uh, we said, uh, and Doc said particularly, what we need are some large pictures, you know, single pictures. Well, can you do that? Doc says, sure. 
we didn't have the camera to do it yet, <laughs> but you know, he knew we could come up with something somewhere. So uh, we went back, and incidentally, on the basis of that, not that alone, but on the basis of that, we did get the contract with the AEC. We were their first prime contractor. Not because of that, but because of the timing and firing, and this, this kind of helped. So we put on a full blast program to try to develop a camera which would take a single picture, you know, maybe two or three inches square, uh, in a very short time. <coughs> and one of them was a, uh, was a camera called a, uh, from Eastman Kodak, called a uh, multiple aperture focal plane scanner. That's a mouthful. Uh, it was somewhat similar to one of the early TV systems back in 1916, called the Nipkow disc, right. but not quite the same. Then we had another one uh, in which we used a crystal with polarized polarizers, uh, ammonium dihydrogen phosphate crystal. I worked on that one, and I also worked on the, uh, the Eastman camera. And incidentally, that's how I got into the film business, because the film required for that camera was non-existent, so the camera didn't work. We paid. A, we got three cameras, paid $100,000 for each, and the cameras wouldn't work because the film was wrong. So I got into the film business at that stage, <laughs> came up with an emulsion working with Kodak that made it work. And uh, the ammonium dihydrogen phosphate shutter wasn't working out. Doc, in the meantime, was working on one called the Faraday shutter. And uh, it got down to the point in our program where we had to cut out something and concentrate on one. And we'd already committed ourselves for the Eastman camera, so that was a go. So the other one to cut out was the one I was working on because it just wasn't producing results. So I jumped with Doc and we worked on the, on the uh, magneto shutter. And that's the beginning of the Rapatronic right there. We finally got that up to the point where that would work. But we were hamstrung because in those days the, we knew we had to use polarized light. And, uh, and in order to make it work uh, with a Faraday principle, you have a, a lead glass cylinder with a wire wrapped around it, a coil. And if you uh, discharge a capacitor through that coil, it creates a magnetic field for a very short time. And that actually rotates the plane of polarization. Nothing mechanically moves. It just rotates the plane of polarization, and it lets the light through. But using a polar, two polarizers together, when you cross them, doesn't produce enough density. It produces enough density so that you know you could use them as goggles to watch an A bomb, but not enough to exclude light uh, the way we we had to. So I came up with the idea of using two systems. Uh, one of them with a cylinder and the, and the cross polarizers, and a third one behind it, or a second one behind it, and. Uh, so we, we tried to get Polaroid to make this for us, and Lan, Din Land said, well, that isn't going to work. You know, you, you get infinite density on nickel prisms. And I said, well, we're not using nickel prisms. So the thing that makes this work is the fact that you've got a polarizer system here, and the light leakage that comes out is still plain polarized. He said, therefore, you could use it. Oh, yes. He said, that's right. Now, he didn't agree to this right away. I had to bring the whole team over. I had to bring Doc. I had to bring Ken Germersauden, I had to bring Bob Morris, uh, Bob Davis, and there, there was an array of us, maybe of a half a dozen, sitting in his office trying to convince him it would work so that he ought to make it for us. He said, that's fine, I agree, but how are we going to know that we're lined up? We don't have a photocell that'll work. And I said, well, Doc said, we do, because we've just been working on something similar to that, so we'll give you a photocell system to tell you when they're, when they're properly oriented. So that's, that was the beginning of the Rapatronic right there. But we still knew that uh, that wasn't enough density, so we had, to, we had to have a mechanical shutter that would close right after the exposure was made, but that was slow. So we needed another shutter in conjunction with that that would close immediately after the thing was over and not give us a complete density, but give us some. And so that was what we called our, our fuse shutter. We'll get into that in a moment. Tell us about some of the, your experiences in photographing atomic explosions. Well, they're, they're quite interesting. Uh, 
the, this, this Kodak camera that I mentioned to you uh, used a glass disc 21 inches in diameter. And it was very precisely ground. And so that it, it was flat to, a, to better than a thousandth of an inch when it would rotate. And uh, this had to be loaded in the dark. And uh, so we, we, we did it at night. We loaded the camera at night. And then in order to recover it, we had to do it at night, but the helicopters that would take us away, bring us in, take us away, said we can't operate at night. So we have to go in near dusk. And we agreed. We said, with enough cloth, we can probably do this. So Doc and I went out and recovered. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we got the, it was, it was a helicopter operation. We got off the ground. And we started to fly over the crater, and the pilot smelled gas. So he cut the engine right away. And we said, what are you doing? What are you doing? We're, here's the crater we just dug. <laughs> so he said, well, we're, you know, we, we can't fly anymore. We've got to come down. I said, if you come down on that hole, we're all going to die. So he managed to get to the edge of the, of the island when he came down. And we, we hollered. He hollered Mayday on the radio. Now, Mayday is a signal universally accepted everywhere. Everybody listens to it, stops, finds out what the trouble is. Well, the guy at Any We Talk Tower said, wait one. <laughs> so he didn't do any good because by the time we answered him again, we were below the line of sight and he couldn't hear us. So we, that's where we were stuck. And we made our way into the, uh, into the bunker where we were protected. But it was dark. There was no electricity. And we figured that maybe we could activate the telephone system, but we couldn't. It was dark in there, and we couldn't see what we were doing. And uh, I happened to lean against the wall, and there was a battlefield phone there. And just for the heck of it, I cranked it, you know, and somebody said, hello. <laughs> I said, what are you doing out there? I said, well, you know, we're in the bunker. We're stuck. Nobody's supposed to be there. Well, we are. We're stuck. We need some help. We just crashed in our helicopter. <clears throat> so then that started the activity going. And uh, the pilot said, uh, get my friend, uh, Joe Blow, whatever his name was, and he knows what the problem is, and get him to fly a piece out in his helicopter. And uh, so they did. It took, a, you know, it took several hours to do all this. It was a very melodramatic thing. They got out there, and they didn't have the right tools. So Doc, with his trusty screwdriver, said, here, let me do it. <laughs> So he replaced it, and we took off and came back. <laughs> that was one of the hairy things. We had a few more like that, but very interesting adventures. <laughs> I will say that. Doc had a special little island on one of these things, all to himself, and he had a luau party every every three weeks or so, and we'd all come. <laughs> it was luau. <laughs> How long a period of time was he out there? Where, and were you out in the South Pacific doing this? A couple well, of months or half no, a year? Well, no, it was. Uh, this, this covered a period of, of, of several years. But mm -hmm. we'd alternate. We'd, we'd go to, we'd go to Anyway Talk one time, Bikini another time, and then the Nevada test site another time. Mm -hmm. uh, we started really, even though we started out at Any Talk or at Bikini. That was the Navy show. The next move was any we talk, but before that started, we had an operation going out in Nevada. And that was still being designed on the backs of envelopes when we got out there. So we, we manned a big effort there where we had trucks, and, uh, and after that was over, we said we'd then board ship and go out to the any we talk thing. So uh, this covered a period of a number of years, but we, we would be out there any one time for maybe six weeks. Mm. and come back. And Doc didn't always go. He, he went whenever he got the opportunity to go and use his, what he called his Pitalotronic camera. He got some startling pictures because this, this camera, again, it was a special Rapatronic, but it used a very long focal length lens, like a, like a telescope. So our camera stations were usually something like 20 or 30 miles away. Well, with this long telescope, he could get right on top of it. So some of the pictures you've seen of the cabs uh, that haven't quite exploded yet were made with that camera. Okay, let's let's come back just for a little bit to uh, the, the non-military side of, of what you were working on. Um, and I'd like you to talk a bit about 
how the nighttime aerial photography tube was readapted okay. for for a peacetime use. Yes, uh, that would be. Uh, I think the most spectacular one would would be what we call the sun flash, and uh, that got its name because one of the photographic studios in New York City <coughs> was not not excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> I'll start on that one completely. Wait, you can also reference it over your shoulder. Yeah, it's right back there if you need it, if you want to. Oh, <laughs> play okay. With it. So you can see that a little bit. <coughs> All right. <coughs> that frog keeps coming up. Uh, the, the sun flash uh, e evolved as a result of the electronic aerial photography. The aerial photography was a it was called portable because it was in an airplane. It could be moved, <laughs> but it weighed several tons. And uh, it, uh, it, it was basically a, a lot of capacitors put together with one flash tube. And the flash tube is very similar to this one that you can see right in the back of me here. Uh, a number of photographic studios in New York each year would go out to Arizona with a bunch of models to model clothes for things like Montgomery Ward catalog. And this one commercial illustrator was not in on this. They were not politically in. So they said, is there, is, there must be some way that we can bring the Arizona sun into our studio. So they called up Doc. And Doc said, sure, we can do that. Well, again, you know, we didn't know we could, but <laughs> there's always a way. And so I got involved in that almost immediately. And uh, the first thing I did was to find out really what they needed. So I took a... Uh, I took a unit down there that, that fortunately only weighed uh, half a ton <laughs> and, uh, and had a reflector on it. it was, the, the tube was like what you see in back of me, but it was in this big reflector. When I got down to the studio and they told me what the problem was, the first thing I did was to say, paint your walls white. Well, in a photographic studio, that's the last thing you do. You don't want reflections from your walls, but in this case, this would be a, the simulated sky. So they agreed they'd do it. And then I took the reflector off the, uh, off the lamp and uh, got them to rig it up on a tall pole and said, now give me a reflector from one of your spotlights that's about so big. I, it has to be about six or seven inches in diameter. What's that for? I said, well, that's going to look like the sun. That's going to subtend the same angle so that your, your shadows won't be crystal sharp. They'll be the same sharpness as the sun is. We put that in the back of the tube, put this thing up on a, on a pole, and they said, now we need a model. And the, the, uh, the, the president and CEO of Commercial Illustrators was sitting there, so I said, you look like a good model. So you sit out of this, you, oh, no, I don't photograph well. Well, you photograph outside, don't you? Sure, well, this will look like outside. So we <laughs> took a picture of it. Sure enough, they were all flabbergasted when they saw it because it looked just like sunlight. And that's how we got started. So then we came back, I came back, and reported my findings. And that's when we went to work and decided that we would build a sun flash unit for them. We didn't have it called at that time, or named, but we said that's a, we came up, somebody came up with the idea of sun flash, and that stuck. And so we made it pretty, and the photographers accepted it. And uh, even today, this, this of course, occurred I'm trying to think when it did happen. Uh, probably uh, in the mid 50s, something like that. And even today, that sun flash is being used by a number of studios, mm -hmm. not just down in New York, but all over. Of course, EG and G doesn't make them anymore. Somebody else makes them, but at least we got them started. Okay, I think to uh, to finish out, I'd like you to talk about your life after Doc. I know you started up your own company, and just to finish yeah. out your, your story here. All right. Well, my, my connection with Doc continued because uh, he had, every summer he would have a, a bunch of people come in where he'd give them lectures on high-speed photography and things like that. So every year I participated in those things, and that continued on. <coughs> and uh, some of the films that I had invented at EG&G &G for the AEC were quite useful for solar eclipses, so I became known as an eclipse chaser. And uh, I had developed a film 
not for AEC, but for, for NASA, which had a wide exposure lati latitude for use up on the moon. So that was ideal for eclipse photography. So there was a, where there was a, a particularly long uh, eclipse that was going to be, uh, be seen over in Africa. And so I got a couple of friends to help me out on that, and one of them uh, happened to be my patent attorney. And so he agreed, and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll go over and help you, but on the way back home, I'd like to have you help me on my project. Sure, I'll do that. Okay. So I said, what's your project? He said, I'm looking for the Loch Ness Monster. Great. <laughs> so <laughs> I got stuck on that one. Yeah, tell, tell us about that, because I see your name cropping up in Doc's notebooks when he talks about okay. Loch Ness. <laughs> well, Doc had gotten involved in this project before I did, but he said, you're not going to use my name. <laughs> <laughs> said, I'll, I'll loan you some equipment, and which he did. He had developed some equipment for the National Geographic for underwater work. And he said, this ought to, this ought to do for you. So he gave it to Bob Rines to use. And uh, Bob just couldn't get him to come over there. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. But he had trapped me, obviously. And so uh, I, I got to work with Bob on that. And we developed up a system. Each year we'd go over, it would be, it would be better. We'd, uh, we, we finally connected uh, sonars with it and computers and everything else. And we got some pretty good pictures in 1975. And Doc heard about them. So he said, hey, what's what's this that I hear about your pictures from Loch Ness? I said, oh, you, you wouldn't be interested in those, Doc. <laughs> well, what are they like? Ah, you don't want to see them. Well, can I come out and look at them? Oh, sure, if you want. So he and Gene Mooney came out, <laughs> and he looked at them. He said, is it too late to join the team? <laughs> <laughs> so so he, got, he was publicly hooked at that time. And so we went over a number of times. And uh, the last big episode, uh, we, we decided we needed an underwater photographer. And somebody came up with it. We were thinking of, you know, underwater robots and things like that, but we couldn't get our hands on those. We didn't have any money. As a matter of fact, the, our team consisted of ex-MIT guys that were used to scrounging. You know, we'd go down the hall, hey, that's a good piece of equipment. Who owns <laughs> that? And we'd talk the guy into joining the team. He'd bring it over. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, Somebody, we, we couldn't find anybody at MIT that was really working on underwater robots at that time. So somebody came up with the idea of using dolphins, and that was a red-hot idea. So we dived into that one, and I contacted the Navy to see what they were doing, because I knew they were using dolphins for some purpose, and said, what, what kind of harnesses do you use? Well, they wouldn't tell us too much, but they sent us something. They said, here's a harness that we're using. We looked at it, and it was terrible. It was, looked like spaghetti. <coughs> if, you'd put it, if you put the harness on the dolphin, he couldn't ever get out of it. It was a sure death trap. Mm -hmm. So we said, we can't use that. So we developed our own harness called a voluntary harness, where the dolphin would swim into this thing on its own and swim out any time it wanted. And we'd strap the equipment onto it, a camera on one side, a light source on the other. And uh, that looked fine. And we trained the dolphins down in Florida. And uh, it's amazing what you can do with a dolphin. The, uh, the trainer knew exactly how to, how to train them and explained to the dolphin somehow or another through his hand signals that uh, we wanted the dolphins to take pictures of objects a certain size. So they got the idea, well, we're that size, so they were taking pictures of each other. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a kill them with that idea. And they were also taking pictures. They'd come up every now and then and get a picture of us on land. <laughs> but we did have them, uh, we, we got them trained so that they would go underwater, look for these things. And we figured that we didn't know what the so-called monster would do. We knew they weren't monsters, but we didn't know what they were. And so <coughs> we said, we'd better have, we'd better use two dolphins, one of them to ride shotgun for the other in case it got into trouble. And then the third one, or the second one could nosy around and scare the creature off. And as long as we had two dolphins, put cameras on each one. So uh, we knew that with a voluntary harness, we had a very good chance of losing our equipment. If they got tired of it or something, they just drop it. So we decided to train them to retrieve our equipment when they dropped it. 
And we selected what we thought was the smartest dolphin to wear the harness. And the other one, we said, well, you, you'll be the retriever. Well, it turned out the one that we selected as the retriever was the smart one because <laughs> when she, she, dolphins work only for food. They don't work for love or anything else. Their paycheck is a fish. <laughs> so when she saw the other dolphin with a harness on, she knew her, jo her job was to retrieve it, so she poked the other dolphin in the ribs, it would drop the harness, <laughs> she'd get on, get it, and get her fish. <laughs> they're, they're crafty creatures. <laughs> so uh, we got it well trained, and the camera equipment was highly sophisticated at that point. We had, as I say, our own sonar, and of course the dolphin uses sonar, and uh, it did not interfere with the dolphin sonar, except when the, we tried to put the harness on. Then the dolphin didn't like it. So we knew that we couldn't turn the sonar on until the dolphin was already in the harness. So we had a little magnetic switch in the thing, and when the dolphin, when the dolphin had the harness on, we'd reach down to the magnet and turn it on. But the dolphin knew that, so before we got a chance to do it, it would swim away. <laughs> so we built a little automatic pressure switch so that when the dolphin swam down to about 15 feet, the thing would come on, and then it would get us pictures. And uh, now when you go to a dolphin show and you see these stunts, uh, after the stunt has, has been performed, the trainer uh, whistles, a loud whistle, and that's the signal to the dolphin to come up and get his paycheck. So we had to build one of these whistles into the camera. <laughs> and after about 15 pictures, then the whistle would go off and the dolphin would come up and <laughs> get his paycheck and then get back down again. And uh, so we, we knew that, you know, this was going to be it. And so we, we were delayed some six weeks because of our training efforts. So here was everybody over at Loch Ness waiting for us, and we weren't there yet. We finally got the dolphins ready to fly over. And when you transport a dolphin, it's a, it's a tremendous ordeal for a dolphin. But these dolphins had been transported a number of times before, so they knew what, what it was. So you, have to, you have to suspend them in a harness. You have to coat them with lanolin and keep massaging them all the time and squirt water on them. And uh, we reactivated the Hull Aquarium in Boston. That was one that was destroyed during one of the hurricanes. We reactivated it so we could put our dolphin there while, you know, rest up before we went over the ocean. And the dolphin had been there about two days when it died. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that because we were known from, the, we tried to keep it from the press, but we couldn't do it. So we were known as the people who murdered a dolphin. So that ended that project. And uh, we've never been able to reactivate it again, but that would have been the perfect thing. But we kept going over to Loch Ness, trying things out. In fact, the last expedition that Doc was on before he died was over at Loch Ness. He had had a serious problem, an operation, about a year before that. but he. And before that, he had committed himself to give a lecture over in, in Scotland, or England, I guess it was England, at one of the museums. And so uh, Esther tried to keep him from doing it, but he said, no, I'm going to do this. He said, I've spent all this time preparing the lecture. Uh, please let me do it. <laughs> so we took advantage of this time that he was over there and said, OK, we'll mount an expedition. When you're through, come on up, and we'll do something. So that's the way it worked out. And uh, of course, we didn't get anything on that, that expedition either, but uh, he had a chance to get over there and try it. And it wasn't many months after that, in January, that uh, was when he died. So he died with his boots on, doing the things he loved. <laughs> so what's your verdict? Is, is Nessie down there? <laughs> oh, there's something there. There's no question about it. We've got enough data to know that there's something there. We can't tell you how many of they are or what they are. But we know enough to know that they also have a sonar of their own. Mm -hmm. We were very, very fortunate. We tried to scan the spectrum to see if they did have sonar. We never caught it. But one time, we happened to catch one on our sonar down about 300 feet. And it uh, detected our sonar. And so it gave out a burst of its own to see where we are and swam off. And we never caught it again. So at least we, we did see its sonar. So here it is over there. I, it's not a monster, obviously. Uh, everybody has an idea it's a dragon that breathes fire and eats people, <laughs> but it doesn't do that. Apparently, it's very, very shy. Otherwise, it'd be seen much more often. 
And if I had to describe what it was, I'd say it was something like a giraffe without any legs. That's about the size of it. So it's not gigantic. You know, maybe eight or 10 feet long with a long neck. And how many there are, I don't know. Maybe they're dying out. And you can't have one survive as long as this, the reports have been coming in for 1,400 years. So it had to be a family of them of some sort. And you can't have a family smaller than 20. Otherwise, they die out due to inbreeding. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Maybe it was a colony of 20 and they've died out. We don't know. We just don't know. Okay, is there, is there anything else you wanted? To, I've gone through my questions. Is there anything no. else you wanted to talk about? Or? I don't think so. Jim, Jim has a question. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, there's sort of like there's two things. One is, it's, it's funny working on the, on the project. One of the things that people ask me is that once they know about what the EPG did, you know, in terms of that they, so, they somehow were involved with nuclear explosions. Yeah. They were somehow involved with the detention. Okay, yeah. And you know how what people, so people are so negative about yeah. Today. Yeah. But what was what was that like in terms of when you were in the middle of all the testing, in terms of what you thought, what you were doing, and why you were doing it, and where you were going, and what's happening? Because obviously yourself and Doc, you know, cared a great deal for other people. That's right. And what was going on in the world. Yeah. So that must have been a topic that came up occasionally. Um, it didn't really come up until sort of after after the thing. This sounds like the beginning of a formulation of an answer. If you can still okay. be Jason Joyce when you right. deliver, even as you think it through. <coughs> yeah, okay. The, uh, the interesting question is, uh, what is EG&G's involved? Oh, by the way, let me, let me preface this thing by saying that uh, when, when the Atomic Energy Commission was formed uh, and they selected us as a prime contractor, we were still at MIT. We were a partnership at that time, but we had grown to about, from five of us, we had grown to about uh, maybe 40 or 50. And uh, the AEC demanded that we have our own guards. Well, MIT didn't take kindly to that. So they said, you better, you better leave. But we, we were in MIT up until that time. So then we decided that we better incorporate because the AEC couldn't have a partnership with the prime contractors. So we were Edgerton, Germersauden, and Greer Incorporated for a couple of years until people couldn't stumble over the name anymore, so we shortened it to EG&G. And, and that was about 19, oh, I guess uh, probably 48, 49. And uh, we, our, our, basic, uh, our basic interest prior to the war was electronic flash and high-speed motion pictures, and we did consulting work. But after the war, uh, we decided that we'd better, we'd better do something else. And it, it turned out that uh, Herb Greer was part of the Manhattan Project, so this looked like an interesting thing that we might be able to do. And so we turned out to be responsible for the triggering system for the A-bombs, the later A-bombs. So we, we came up with the, with the triggering system. That's one of the things we did. Uh, it looked like we were the ones to take over for the timing and firing because Los Alamos proved that they couldn't do it when they, uh, the bikini test when, when their signals didn't come out right, so we did that. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, we, in talking with the embryo AEC people, uh, we convinced them that we could also do the scientific photography. And the reason for this photography was not documentation, but rather to determine what the efficiency of an explosion was. Because one of the easiest ways that you, that, that, that you can increase the efficiency is, to, or, or rather increase the stockpile, is to increase the efficiency of the explosion. And we developed a system whereby by measuring the diameter of the fireball at a given time and plotting the curve, we could t determine very precisely what the efficiency was. Prior to that, the only way they had of knowing was through radiochemistry. So uh, this was one of the things that we, we, we concentrated on. So all the photography basically was for that purpose, was for measuring the efficiency. And each time 
uh, we would find out what the efficiency was and they'd say, well, let's try this next and measure it again. And so we went from less than a percent efficiency of the Nagasaki-Hiroshima explosions up to you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling, and so on the stockpile just by increasing the efficiency. And uh, I'm not about to tell you what it is now, but it's pretty high. <laughs> and so our work in that end was, uh, was focused on how to increase the efficiency and how to measure it. We did, uh, since we had to build a lot of equipment to do these things, it became obvious that these instruments could be used commercially. So we developed an eg and G, a commercial arm that would produce these instruments for things other than the AEC or the military. And uh, we, we, we came up with new oscilloscopes, we came up with new uh, light measuring equipment. Uh, uh, I came up with a sensitometer, which is used in the photographic business, and a lot of things like this. We developed new cameras, new light sources, underwater photography. A, a new business was created as a result of our underwater photography. And that was uh, Sam Raymond with his benthos equipment. And there are a number of, there are a number of things like this that, that got started. Now, I probably would have uh, continued on with EGNG, but since they were getting out of the photographic end of things, and that was my specialty because I would worked on that, uh, Fred Barstow and I, I had to buy back the patents that EGNG had, and we decided to buy those back and start selling this film commercially. You know, it, it, it didn't, wouldn't have a wide use, but scientifically it had a, had a good use. And uh, unfortunately, <coughs> during this time, my son was killed, so I got, I got bypassed on that and decided to go into something that would have saved his life if we had it on the roads. And so that's my business now called Brightline. It's a new highway marking system. But EG&G has, uh, has continued on. They're, they're, I, I understand now that they're getting out of the Defense Department business altogether. But up until the last few years, that was their major source of income. Not A-bombs, obviously, because that was still part of it, but a very small part of it. And uh, Herb Greer had a, had a bad conscience problem, so he, he finally decided he didn't want to have anything to do with atom bombs anymore. And so he was the only one in the whole group that really f felt morose about it, I guess. Mm. I don't think Barney O'Keefe felt that way, although he told people he did. He didn't really, because he knew, he knew what the purpose was. And if we didn't do it, the Japanese, the Germans, somebody would do it, and we had to keep in the on the forefront. Because this was, a, this was the sort of weapon that the United States should have control over. Not to use it indiscriminately, but to make sure nobody else used it. But t to do this, we had to make sure that we had a decent stockpile. Because we knew the Russians were building up their stockpile, and they did it the same way. So I don't think any of us had a, had a conscious problem that way, although that wasn't our primary business. Is this more or less what you had in mind, Jim? Yeah, or I think that's good. I think that's good. Okay. okay. And then one last thing, which is this, if there is a... We have to put on a tape. You can okay. put it on your yank, or I can put it on the table. Just, I think it might be real quick. Just okay. If you, if you could just say very briefly, what do you think the sort of like the long-lasting legacy importance of Doc Edwards Okay, <clears throat> Doc's main memory should be his way that he gets people interested in experiments and learning. He turns out to be an excellent teacher in a way that other people hadn't ever thought of, and that was to get the students involved with their hands early in experiments. and. Uh, he believed that there was no such thing as a failure, that you always learn something. If you didn't learn anything else, well, that, that way isn't the way to do it. You've got to do it some other way. So that's his legacy, really, how to, how to teach people. And he created a, a new method of doing it, and I think that's going to become more obvious as time goes on. And I think this is going to be felt in, in Strobe Alley. Uh, Kim Van Diver has taken over, and he's an ideal guy to do this because I think he feels the same way.